It was April 19, 1775, and a force of some 700 British Light Infantry and Grenadiers, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, was in retreat. Sent to confiscate military supplies stored by the Massachusetts militia near Concord, Massachusetts, the force had run into an unexpected battle. The first engagement had come in the town of Lexington, and then another at Old North Bridge in Concord. The colonial militia were gathering more quickly and in larger numbers than the British had expected, and were harrying the British force, attacking from ambush and refusing to engage in a pitched battle. Hurriedly, a brigade under the command of Brigadier General Hugh Percy was being sent to reinforce Smith. Both British columns were finding themselves harried by the ever-growing force of militia. One such ambush occurred as grenadiers of the 47th Regiment, part of Percy's column, crossed a field near the town of Monotomy. A militiaman named Samuel Whitmore rose from behind a stone wall and fired with a musket, killing a soldier. He then did two dueling pistols, killing a second soldier and mortally wounding a third. As soldiers converged on him, he drew a sword, a fancy French officer's sword, and swung at them. He was shot in the face, clubbed over the head with a musket, and bayoneted several times. It was a brave last stand for Whitmore. Notable because, at the age of 78, he was the oldest known colonial combatant in the American Revolutionary War. There are conflicting stories about Samuel Whitmore. Some claim that he was born in England and came to the U.S. as a trooper in a unit of dragoons. Other records have him being born in Massachusetts in 1696. In 1744, he participated as a private in Colonel Jeremiah Moulton's 3rd Massachusetts Regiment, where he took part in the siege of the French fortress of Louisbourg during King George's War, one of several wars between the British colonies and the French. At 48, he was not a young man, but he went to war nonetheless. He returned with the sword of a French officer, with one legend being that he only ever said that the previous owner had died suddenly. Some sources claim that Whitmore volunteered again during the French and Indian War in 1754 and Pontiac's War in 1763, with some claiming that he brought back his two French dueling pistols, whose previous owner he claimed once again had died suddenly. But there seems to be no record to support these claims of further service. If he did serve in those conflicts, it would have been extraordinary, as he would have been 58 and 67 years of age, respectively. What is recorded is that he was commonly referred to as Captain Sam, suggesting some service as an officer after King George's War. But in any case, there is record that he became involved in the Patriot cause as early as 1766, when the 70-year-old was elected to a committee to represent the County of Cambridge's response to the repeal of the Stamp Act to their representative to the Massachusetts General Court. The committee soundly denounced the act as it would in its operation have totally ruined the province and greatly hurt Great Britain, and further instructed the representative to be always watchful for any further danger which may prove unfriendly to our liberty. Thus, Whitmore established himself as a supporter of the Patriot cause nearly a decade before the battles of Lexington and Concord. And two years later, Whitmore, now 72 years old, was elected by the people of Cambridge to represent them in what was called a Committee of Towns. Called to represent the people as the royal governor had dissolved the Massachusetts House of Representatives for denouncing the towns and duties, yet another British tax on the colonies. Accepting the appointment was no small deal, as the committee was extra-legal, and membership could be counted as treason. The committee was dominated by moderates and offered petitions to the governor and king that were largely ignored. But the convention did, however, bring Whitmore into contact with more militant patriots like Samuel Adams. Two years later, Whitmore was again elected by the people of Cambridge, this time to the Cambridge Committee of Correspondence, a reaction to a similar Boston committee. The tone of this committee responding to the tea tax was more forceful than previous documents to which Whitmore had attached his name. The letter the committee signed concluded, the late act of the British Parliament empowering the East India Company to export tea on their own account and the exposure the same to sale is a recent proof of the determination of the ministry to pursue their diabolical plan to enslave the Americans. The response at the time almost certainly served to inspire the Boston Tea Party. Again, Whitmore was risking his life and property to take a stand against what he perceived to be a threat to the people's liberty. It is not surprising that he chose to pick up a musket that April of 1775. In fact, he had been risking himself in the same cause for nearly a decade. Whitmore was not the only Minuteman on the field. The fight with the militia in the town of Monotomy was particularly deadly for the British that day. Nearly half of their dead from the battles of Lexington and Concord fell there. Many militiamen had witnessed his brave last stand, and it was those same people who elected him to those committees, who with a heavy heart came to collect his broken body. 
Behind the wall, they were stunned to find that not only was Samuel Whitmore not dead, but that he was attempting to load his musket to take another shot at those whom he feared were trying to enslave the Americans. His face was a mass, a musket ball having torn through his cheek, and he had been bayoneted at least six times. In 2005, the state legislature proclaimed Sam Whitmore to be the official hero of the state of Massachusetts. If you read his biographies, they tend to focus on his brave last stand and all those other wars he purportedly fought in, but they tend to give short shrift to his civic leadership, which came at the time that the patriot cause was coalescing, and explain why the aged patriot was so willing to risk his life in 1775 for the cause in which he believed. His friends placed him on a stretcher made out of a door, carried him to the nearby Cooper Tavern where a doctor was treating the wounded. The doctor took one look at him and confirmed what they all already knew. These wounds were surely mortal. Although the doctor did bandage them anyway at the insistence of his friends, they carried him to his farmstead where he could die surrounded by his friends and family. Which he did 18 years later, in 1793, at the age of 96. If you enjoyed this History Guy short, then feel free to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and check us out on Patreon, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and our merchandise on teespring.com.